I'm Scott McLeod. This is the summer of 2007. And this talk is about the internet, a history of the internet. The internet is a global network of computer networks that have ability, the ability to talk to each other. And this is the tricky part. And reroute messages through alternative paths when a path is blocked. And infinite there are an infinite number of alternative paths theoretically in the internet. Not all computer networks are on the internet. For example, some parts of global financial markets. Uh, the internet has a long and fascinating history. In 1969 it was first formed and today's internet became popular in 1994, 1995. And the internet became popular in large part due to Netscape's Mosaic, which was the first graphical user interface, GUI, G-U-I. A significant lapse of time passed uh, since the internet's early development and the time that Mark Andreessen and others uh, developed Mosaic. The internet's origins. There was a popular story, there is a popular story about how the internet started. And that story is false, namely that it was military technology designed to prevent collapse of communications in case of a nuclear attack. The internet started in an innovative research agency in 1958 at ARPA, Advanced Research Projects Agency. And it started in response to Soviet advancement. And its intention was to mobilize intellectual resources of the academic world to build superior technology. A small group of people at ARPA received a very little bit of money. It was peanuts money in the Pentagon scheme of things, but huge for the academic world. ARPA had a reputation for starting projects with almost complete academic freedom. The Information Protocol Technology Office, IPTO, conceived the notion then of exploring computer networking. A fundamental pioneer in the call for a global network was Joseph Licklitter, and he articulated this idea for this global network in a January 1960 paper, Man-Computer Sym Symbiosis. And after that, Robert Taylor was promoted to the head of information processing at ARPA. And he brought in Larry Roberts from MIT, and they initiated a project to build such a network. And the first ARPANET link was established between the University of California, Los Angeles and the Stanford Research Institute in 1969. In early computing networking, there were two big problems. One was transmission technology, the other was communication software. And within transmission technology, packet switching is the key. And it was developed independently by two people. Paul Baran in the United States and Donald Davies in Britain. Baran, when he developed packet switching, was working at the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica, California, one of the most sophisticated think tanks in the late 1950s. The Rand Corporation worked on a project to organize a communication system, which was invulnerable to nuclear attack. How? Make it placeless. Make it so that it's nowhere or everywhere, so that there's no command and control center. This would require a huge number of nodes. And the Pentagon rejected the idea of node technology. But the idea that all nodes might reorganize was around in 1954. 
The Pentagon rejected it and didn't implement Brand's ideas. Brand's ideas didn't get approval, but Paul Brand did develop packet switching. In a parallel development, and without knowing so, Donald Davies, a physicist in a leading British physics center, the National Physics Center, developed packet switching also. And he worked at the center until the 1970s. And so the technology was thus available in the United Kingdom as well. But similarly, the U National Physics Center turned it down. So Britain could have started the internet. So we have the IPTO, and we have Donald Davies, and Paul Baran, and still no network. In the late 1960s, in Nashville, Tennessee, people in the Defense Department observed that there still wasn't proper technology to meet their goals for a decentralized system. And they asked, who is Paul Baran and what was the defense project that he was working on? And they found Paul Baran's proposal. And they took this packet switching idea and turned it into the ARPANET. So ARPANET in 1969 was built by a group of computer scientists circulating between major universities, MIT, UCLA, Stanford, Utah, University of California, Santa Barbara, and Berkeley. And the context in which these scientists were working uh, from time to time included working with the RAND Corporation and Stanford Research Institute, which became, this, which became Stanford Research International and then SRI, and a company called BBN, for example. BBN was a small acoustic engineering firm, a spin-off from MIT in the Route 128 area around Boston. Ray Tomlinson's work there, creating a network, was the very first uh, mail uh, protocols application for this very early network. And this became email. So email was, came along in 1971 when Ray Tomlinson of BBN sent his first email on the network. And by 1973, 75% of the ARPANET traffic was email. File transfer occurred also in 73, or by 73. The file transfer protocol specification had been defined and implemented. And this enabled file transfers over the ARPANET. There was even a voice protocol, a voice traffic protocol in the early 70s. And they were implemented, but conference calls over the ARPANET never worked well at the time. And packet voice would not become a workable reality for several decades. All of these computer scientists brought graduate students to work with them. And so what shaped the early ARPANET was big science from universities with Defense Department money. What were they doing? They didn't know. They came together to share computing time by moving data between computers. And so in 1972, all of this led to the first demonstration of ARPANET in Washington, D.C. And ARPANET was operational campus-wide soon after, as well as in Geneva and London, and it worked. ARPANET said that this research wasn't really military, so they decided to privatize. And ARPANET offered it to AT&T, uh, which decided that it didn't have commercial application. And they left it in the hands of computer scientists. Get serious. 
it was a serious concern for the university. They saw a global network, and the problem was communication protocols. So communication protocols are common programs for computers to talk to one another. And the best students were put on it. And they shaped the network working group. And there were a few key people, Vint Cerf from Stanford, a self-proclaimed father of the World Wide Web, Steve Crocker at USC, University of Southern California, who developed requests for comments, which became a feedback mechanism that led to improvements, which was part of the process of the development of the internet. John Postal from UCLA, who developed RFC 793 and the domain system, and also became an internet moral authority, and Bob Kahn, these four people ultimately designed internet protocols with University of Southern California and UCLA students. And there was also a California MIT connection. Transmission control protocol, internet protocol, was what was needed and what people were developing. Vint Cerf went to the IPTO and met Paul Buran. And from 1973 to 1978, they published a series of papers on TCP IP, Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol, on which the internet is based today and which allows networks to talk with one another. By and large, by the end of the 1970s, all the work was done on networks on TCP IP, rather, and the internet could operate. And so, in the hands of big science, and in response to this development, de the Defense Department started to get serious. So, the Defense Department started to get serious. They had put so much money into networking technologies and over 80% of the use of the internet in uh, the late 70s and early 80s was for email. Uh, the most popular email lists were the San Francisco lovers of science fiction and the marijuana procurement list. In 1973, the Defense Department decided to split ARPANET into two. Um, Milnet, which would be a military network for email systems for units, and ARPANET Internet for research and civilian purposes. And they decided to transfer most of the network to the National Science Foundation, NSF. In 1990, ARPANET was old and tired and was decommissioned and its research became part of military development. And also in 1990, the civilian side became part of the NSF, uh, which lasted only for a short time. The NSF received instructions to privatize, to start to privatize, and they received a commission with plans to privatize uh, in the mid-90s. In, and in 1995, the internet was privatized. On the other hand, uh, roots of the internet, the internet was also a grassroots system, a countercultural movement acting as an instrument of freedom and alternative thinking. The same students as above who were working on TCP IP and early networking technologies were around universities and contributed to uh, the alternative and free speech oriented aspects of the internet. So three major contributors brought about the internet. 
Uh, there was big science, there was military, and there was the counterculture. And they simultaneously created the internet. So the medium, the internet, was invented and it used telephone lines to allow computers outside ARPANET to communicate. In 1978, Duke University students in North Carolina developed software and distributed it for free called Usenet, which was a global distributed internet discussion system. By 1978, personal software already existed. Mo's software has since piggybacked on the generosity of these pioneers who made this early software, including Usenet, and especially Usenet. They created a network. Usenet became a BBS, a bulletin board system, and it was fairly fully developed uh, in 78 and 1979 uh, into Usenet News. And the advantages of this Usenet network were that it used telephone lines to connect a network to other networks. And this was a cheap dial-up system like today still. And the disadvantage was that it had little transmission capacity and no ARPANET connection. At first, ARPANET disallowed Usenet connectivity. Usenet and ARPANET. But there was a bigger problem. The softwares of Usenet and ARPANET couldn't communicate. ARPANET had a node at Berkeley in 1978-79 and students use, designed software there to connect ARPANET and Usenet. And this fusion ultimately became the internet. In, the internet came from the top and the bottom simultaneously, therefore. FIDO. Another tradition developed which never connected to ARPANET. In 1983, Tom Jennings designed a program to allow dial-up connections, FIDO. He called it FIDO. He built single-handedly a global network called FIDONet, also called the poor man's internet. It could be used for the price of a local phone call. And three million users were still on FIDONet in the year 2000. Number of internet users. The number of internet users. In 2000, there were 400 million people on the internet. And today, uh, 2005, it's between 600 million and a billion out of 6.5 billion people in the world. It's one of the most dramatic uh, examples of growth in the use of a technology ever. So the formation of the internet came from the military, university, and students interested in allowing students to communicate freely and for free. And many of these technologies are still used. For example, mailing lists, postings, chat rooms, and all of this developed from connecting the personal computer to the world. Stages of development. A summary. From the late 60s to the 70s, military research sponsored out of computer departments of leading universities, military funded research sponsored out of computer departments of leading universities. ARPANET in the 1970s for both military, which led to MILNET and civilian use. And third, uh, in the late 1970s, communication software, publicly developed software, where everyone benefits. In the 1990s, ARPANET was closed. 
Usenet. Usenet had two developments. It could communicate with ARPANET in the mid 80s. And secondly, Usenet could go from could go global from the beginning, while ARPANET couldn't. The global connection of the internet came via Usenet. Institutional development. Institutional development occurred uh, in the early first half of the 1990s. The U.S. government gradually moved to privatization via the National Science Foundation, and in 1995 it was privatized. Software for this came from the private sector. Who could do this? This is the remarkable thing. Anyone was allowed to set up nodes and use the backbone of the internet. Universities, private companies, anyone with a server. Even with Usenet, this was so, but it required some technical sophistication. There wasn't any user-friendly technology. And here is where something socially important happened. Editor programs and the World Wide Web. editor programs and the World Wide Web. From 1991 forward, editor programs were published on the World Wide Web. Editor browser programs were designed to allow access and combine information. How did this happen? It was unplanned. A British programmer, Tim Berners-Lee, with Roger Collian, was a staff programmer working in Geneva at CERN. Uh, high, he had a high energy physics job um, and he was working full time. He was in love with his job but worked during the spare time and without his boss knowing it, he created the World Wide Web. His immediate boss said, you are working on the internet, drop this American technology and he wrote programs for HTML, Hypertext Markup Language, HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, URLs, uh, Uniform Resource Locators, which he finished in 1990. Tim Berners-Lee and BBS's bulletin board systems. By August 1991, Berners-Lee at CERN posted online in his BBS all software and instructions on how to get it free. The intermediate step for internet development between Berners-Lee and the public was students. Mosaic. At the University of Illinois at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, NCSA, folks said that what Berners-Lee had done was cool. But it would be even cooler or greater with graphics. So Mosaic was developed by Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina. The first browser to actually implement images embedded in the text rather than displaying them in a separate window was Mosaic. The NCSA released the browser in 1993 and web browsers were the killer applications of the 1990s because they were the first programs to provide a multimedia graphical user interface. The first popular worldwide web browser and Gopher client was Mosaic. It was reliable, it was easy to install, and it opened the web up to the general public. Mosaic was free. In 1973, Mosaic was released online for free following tradition. A real entrepreneur, Jim Clark, saw a money opportunity. He had created Silicon Graphics and was bored. In 1973, he hired Andreasen and Bina to commercialize Mosaic. The product was under a university license, and he created Netscape. They shipped the first browser in December 1994. Netscape and Microsoft. In 1995, Microsoft saw the significance of the Internet. 
and an urgent need for browsers. Microsoft bought a browser from Spyglass, who developed it from Tim Berners-Lee's work. Microsoft released Internet Explorer in 1996. Then the whole world could surf using the World Wide Web. After that, Netscape, now headed by Barksdale, Tale, and writing and uh, producing Mosaic, uh, and Microsoft entered, entered into a commercial war. Netscape and Microsoft. In 1999, Netscape released source code from Netscape Navigator. Microsoft had done enough that Netscape couldn't survive commercially. AOL, American, America Online, then bought Netscape. And that was the line of development vis-a-vis -vis browsers and users in the 1990s. Why did this battle occur over browsers? Because browsers offered a user-friendly way to surf the net. Tim Berners-Lee devised a browser editor, which people used only as a word editor, and then passively. Due to browsers, the rate of expansion outside a knowledgeable community was enormous and a key element behind the growth of the internet. Internet and synergies. The internet developed from the synergies between a scientific culture, military funding, and grassroots contributors from and for the people. Military and software. About the military, there wasn't any significant software with military applications throughout the 1970s and 1980s. Still, the military was impressed, and in a Cold War context, the military provided researchers with an unlimited level of funding. The military was decisive in terms of context, that is funding, but not in terms of software itself. That is, there wasn't any software they supported which could knock down the Soviets, for example. The Defense Department and Academic Freedom. By pure luck, the Defense Department supported the development of the internet in the context of a research agency. Usually, any program funded by the military has specific goals and narrow applications. In this particular case, academics working in defense understood that freedom for academics was essential. Academic freedom in this context was an essential part of this process of development. Academic freedom in this context was an essential part of this process of development. The military and academics. In the 1970s and 80s, both wanted something, a technology, that was so good that missiles wouldn't matter. While the internet was a decentralized and open communication system, it wasn't anything like a weapons system. Nevertheless, in the context of the US military environment, there was full financial support. Business wasn't significant in the internet's origins. So business didn't play a role at the source of design and development of the internet until the 1990s. In terms of prevailing ideology, business was completely out of the process. Business couldn't have created this. Public money from the military was a prime cause. Public money. Public money was the cause of the internet, contrary to what he said, Al Gore didn't invent it. But he was very important in characterizing the information superhighway and providing support on Capitol Hill. Public money, in terms of research money, uh, relating specifically to the military and academic academia and goodwill were uh, where the sources of funding were deliberately without an interest in outcomes. The most important technology of our time did not come from business. What is the internet? Because the internet 
developed in the way outlined above. The internet is not the telephone lines or computers. What is it in terms of architecture? It's software, non-material protocols of information. The architecture is organized in such a way that it was open at two levels. From 1973 to 1978, TCP IP, Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol, those uh, protocols that in a way shape the routing of information, was open to everyone. And secondly, the notion of distributive computing means that the power of processing is distributed throughout the entire network, and in this way it's open as well. The internet vis-a-vis -vis cable and DSL, digital subscriber lines. The more people use cable, the slower the, da the data transmission, or this was the case in the 90s and in the early 2000s. Cable communication system speeds, that is broadband, depend on how many people are using the system. Digital subscriber line, DSL, can transmit both internet and telephone conversations at the same time. The limitations of DSL uh, are the following. The, any user cannot be too far around one and a half miles from transmission stations due to data loss. The internet is, an, as an entire system, can dispatch and reroute throughout the entire system. It was DSL and cable that made this trans the transmission of data uh, faster and more efficient. Internet structure. The internet is distributed. It's a star system. The internet is based on protocols, TCP IP, Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol. It's an open architecture and distributive computing system. It's also a node system. Nodes, 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 a node is a device that is connected as part of a network, a computer network. Every node has to have a MAC address or a data link control address if it is at least an OSI, Open Systems Interconnection Basic Reference Model, Model Layer 2 device. Nodes can be computers, personal digital assistants, PDAs, cell phones, or various other network appliances, such as routers, switches, and hubs. Nodes that actively route data for the other networked devices, as well as themselves, are called supernodes. Internet communication. On the internet, messages which are censored are interpreted as blocked and rerouted. Communication on the internet that goes around comes around. Openness is one of its main principles. Some, quote, laws of the internet. Users are producers of technology is the first. Most actual applications are not planned or designed by engineers. For example, email was not planned. Programmers saw it was cool and said, we'll program it for it. For example, cell phones. The main use of mobiles is for personal messages. 75% of uh, calls are personal messages. No one ever thought that young people staying in touch would be so important that the cell phone would become a backbone of the family. Multicultural and international. Two, from the beginning, the internet has been multicultural and international, countering the myth that it's an American technology and military product. Researchers above were always connected with other international researchers. Transmission control protocol, internet protocol was invented by Americans, Vint Cerf, Bob Kahn, French, Gerard Lalande uh, in the Cyclades Sigali project. And the World Wide Web uh, was started by a British programmer, 
at an international research center in Geneva, Switzerland. Usenet. Developers came from different countries. By and large, over the past 20 years, a stream of contributions to the internet came from around the planet. Glasnost in the 1980s in Russia and the end of the imperial network uh, meant that internet diffused information into Russia. Governance, third law. Three, the internet has been by and large self-regulating, although formerly the internet was run by defense and the Department of Commerce. In fact, it is self-governed in a strange way. What is self-government? Government? It's a set of software to make sure protocols are common and the address system is common. After that, the network does it by itself. Self-governance. These developed from the network working group in the late 1970s, where, for example, RFCs, requests for comments, were a very significant development in how the network develop, working group developed TCP IP. With RFCs, requests for comments, any disagreement would lead to an agreement, which is a protocol. Surf and Khan, Vint Surf and Bob Khan, organized this through the Internet Engineering Task Force and Open Internet Committees, these two institutions, one Internet Engineering Task Force and two Open Internet Committees. Domain names. URLs, Uniform Resource Locators, where the name corresponds with a number. What about them? One person asked whether someone should take care of it in the late 70s, early 80s. No one was interested. So John Postel, a USC professor, University of Southern California professor, said he would. He, John Postel, single-handedly organized the assignment of names on the internet. He died in 1998. Before dying and while ill, he designed a democratic authority to manage the internet. ICON, in the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. In 1998, uh, Postel created this organization as for governance. ICON was recognized as the domain name authority. The Internet Naming Authority was transferred to this body and Europe has been skeptical about the relationship between ICON and the US government for some years. ICON, the I-C-A-N-N, -N, the principal Elected officials from a global network of representatives come together to make decisions. Anyone can be a member. In the year 2000, there were 140,000 members. In 2000, 35,000 of these members voted for, from all over the planet. ICON, 15 voter members, voting members of the ICON board of directors are present. Currently, it has board members from six continents and has only two U.S. directors. ICON has the ability to assign name addresses. The historical contractual links to the U.S. government and the U.S. Department of Commerce with ICON have been significant. ICON's chairman now, in the mid-2000s, Vint Cerf, is a noted father of the internet who was appointed by ICON's nominating committee. Critiques of ICON. The system has two critiques. The first is that it's democratic, but it's not democratic. There are, of course, lobbies where money plays a very big role, and so does the name recognition process in ICON. And all candidates aren't equal, but most people don't care. Technical agencies are still much controlled by Americans. The second critique of ICON is by big corporations. 
and namely that ICON is subject to crazy people. For example, the European rep in 2000 was a hacker from the German Chaos Club, XAOS. ICON is not a democratically represented body, is what these corporations also uh, say. And it's also a non-traditional form of government rooted in the chaos of the internet tradition. This is part of the critique. A cultural history of the internet. The internet could have been completely different. For example, it could have been completely top-down and not based on distributive computing. History is made uh, by people with values, ideas, and preferences. What ultimately shapes the internet depends on ideas, on the ideas and values of different groups who contributed to the internet. Culture shaping the internet. Cultures that have made the internet are four. Culture in this case is a set of values and beliefs that influences behavior. What are the cultures behind the ideas of the internet? The four cultures are first the techno-meritocratic culture. The techno-meritocratic culture values good technology. Good software is the supreme value. The model is similar to the academic world and is supposed to be based on excellence. Excellence is valued as well as the joy of discovering. In a techno-meritocratic culture, there is less emphasis on money, although that is changing and may have changed a lot. Excellence and meritocracy are key. To develop good technology is also essential. For example, Vince Cerf used Defense Department money and wanted good software available to everyone. The second main culture that contributed to the internet is the hacking culture, hacker culture. And on the, base, on the basis of techno, the techno-meritocratic culture, uh, this hacker culture developed. Uh, Pekka Hymanen, in his book The Hacker Ethic and the Spirit of the Information Age, published by Random House and co-authored by Linus Torvalds, the originator of Linux and an introduction by Manuel Castells um, suggests that the hacker ethic includes passion, hard work, creativity, and joy and that these were the values that gave rise to informationalism. In the media often a hacker has been constructed as a kind of criminals, a criminal and in this view, those are crackers. It, a hacker is someone for whom good software is the most important thing. It's one who hacks, who says, I'm going to find a new solution, and then shares it. Hackers are not two types. They are not criminals, and they aren't part of the cracker subculture. Hackers hate them. Crackers, crackers on the other hand, crack codes for the challenges of it. They make problems for government and those who make pro viruses are sometimes called political crackers. Most crackers are kids playing, challenging the world. Hackers, on the other hand, work for the pleasure of doing it. Hackers and the internet. The way hacker culture relates to the internet is in some ways that hackers think that free speech is free and so is good software. And companies are threatened by this. The majority of hackers need free software to improve software through information exchange and free software. It's a network. Linux, a free operating system. The name Linux comes from Linus Torvald, a Finn. He first called this operating system FreeX, F-R-E-I-X, but server administrators called it Linux and released 
the program uh, because he wanted the program to be improved. Thousands and thousands of people improve it for free. Linux and free software. Why keep it free? Well, if you freeze it for yourself, you close it off. So you give in order to be given. There's prestige among ha that prestige among hackers is important. Free software is part of a tradition and hacker value system which says you want to make something that will change the world and benefit people. For example, Dan Brooklyn, who invented VisiCalc, the first spreadsheet in the 1970s and a very popular application. Hackers in making money. Most can get money, but not all can be recognized. Hackers aren't against money, but against money as a supreme value. In a techno-meritocratic culture, it's essential to keep free all key software on the internet. Communitarian culture, the third kind of culture that gave rise to the internet. Communitarian culture of the internet do, do, is not by any means made up of hackers, all hackers. What was important was people communicating with people. So communities took shape online. They shared information, they engaged in chat rooms, they played with and contributed to lists and listservs. Fourth, the culture that uh, came much later in the development of the internet was the entrepreneurial culture and only in the 1990s did they make significant contributions to the internet. They said all these technologies are great let's make a pile of money but they also recognized that it was a risky investment that is business making a business out of applications. They helped to diffuse the internet to the rest of the world and contributed to market development and the use of the internet by large numbers of people. So the contribution of cultures to the internet in terms of importance it first is the techno-meritocratic culture, second the hacker culture, third the communitarian culture, and lastly the entrepreneurial um, culture around money and diffusing the technology.